But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics, most golds rowdy by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Davis looks like he's going to win it, and Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com Hey everybody, welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast Show. This is going to be a good one. This is one of my favorite swimmers in the world. He was a multiple-time national age group record holder, an Olympian, a six-year member of Team USA, a three-time national champion in the 200-yard fly in college for Berkeley, and now an awesome master swimmer. He's an ultimate dad to seven kids, ultimate husband to an amazing swimmer named Liesl, and just one of my favorite dudes in the whole world, a true ultimate swimmer, Ur Tanner. Welcome to the show, Ur. Hey, thanks, Josh. It's good to see you and good to be talking to you in the swimming community. Well, I'm so excited that the swimming community gets to meet you, one of my favorite guys in the world. You know, most people are blessed to have a couple of best friends in their life. I've probably had about four or five best friends in my life so far, and, and I'm just so honored to call you one of them. Yeah. And uh, we have some great times on the road together with the Team USA traveling and rooming together. And now we just get to vacation a little bit with our families a little bit each year together. And um, so I'm excited to retell some stories and talk shop and talk about what works and what we've learned along the way. Yeah. And so you you have a unique uh, beginnings. You were born in Turkey and then moved to Seattle when you were six months old. Is that correct? I actually moved to Indiana when I was seven months old. So I was probably growing up in a town. I was growing up in a town called Lafayette, which is, I think, about 30 or 40 minutes away from the Indy pool, you know, where we eventually swam lots of times. Uh, but yeah, I was four and a half when I moved to Seattle. And uh, I didn't start swimming until I was nine. And that was on a uh, just a summer rec team. It was just wow. uh, I was playing at the pool with my friends that I just met in the neighborhood and his mom, his name was Aaron Carpenter and his mom was the coach and we would just play around in the pool and it's hot summer days. Uh, and he would say, Hey, you're pretty good. Why don't you join the swim team? And you know, you could come to the meets and we'll be with our buddies at the swim meet. And so I joined the team and the rest is history. So really within just a few years, you set a national age group record, the 13, 14, 50, 100. Was it the 200 as well or just the 50 and the 100? The 50, 100, 200, and the 200 IM. That's right. You had all four. Yeah. Whoa. So so by the time you're 14, you're the, you know, just five years later, you're the fastest 14-year-old ever in American history at the time. What did your coaches and parents do well? What did you do well in that in those years from 9 to 14 that you can remember? I think it's because I had a beard when I was 12. <laughs> um, I don't know. So I, I joined my club team after that summer. 
of my nine, you know, I joined. So I was like, I turned 10 in June uh, of 1984. And then I joined Chinook Aquatic Club. And so from 10 to 14, yeah, I, I, I grew a lot. I, I grew early. So I was pretty tall. I, I think I was at least, you know, we met at Long Beach that year in 1985. What year was it? Was it 88? 87. 88, 87. I don't know. I thought, was, sure. I thought it was 80. I thought it was eight, March of 89. Or was it March well, 92, of 88? Barcelona 90, was 92. So work back to four years from that. So it was 87, 88 or something. Yeah. And so we met at that Long Beach Juniors, and I think I was probably at least six one, six I don't know, maybe I was six two, I don't remember. But so I grew a lot and I'm I have a thin build. I'm pretty thin. Uh so I was really light in the water and not a lot to carry. And I don't know, I just I got fast so pretty soon. Yeah, so 14 years old. What would you remember? I went 20.7, you went 20.8. 2089, I remember it, yeah. 20.89 to set the 14 and under national age group record. Yeah. Do you remember your 100 time? 45.75. Ooh, and what was your 200 time? 139.50. Wow, as a 14-year-old? Yeah. And then what was your 200 IM time? 152 flat. All at yeah. 14, yeah. freshman year, and I, I was 16, so I was a junior, and I thought I was so cool because I had a mohawk. Yep, you did. I had a big blonde mohawk, and we flew over from Texas to California, and we were just loving it. We were walking around Venice Beach and Muscle Beach, and then we'd go to Long Beach to race in the old Belmont Plaza pool, the That's great right. pool there. Is a, that deep end is fast. It's a fast short course in the deep end. Yeah. There. And I did my lifetime best times, 20.8. And I won the 200 back, 150.8, I think it was. Oh, man. So back then, that was really good. So I won the 53 and the 200 back. And you were right there. Uh, we just went one, two, boom, boom, boom. And yeah. we, we were kind of started our friendship a little bit. That's right. And, um, do you remember Janet Evans drove up to the pool in her red convertible BMW and gave out the awards to us that night? I don't remember that her driving up, but I, I do faintly remember now that you mentioned it, uh, yeah. that she did hit, hand out our awards. Yeah. She handed out the awards to us that night. Cause she was just, uh, you know, getting pretty famous mm -hmm. of her, of her 88 Olympics. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, that was, a, that was a, really epic week for you and a, and a real, you know, a good meet for me. And um, so that's, that's just fascinating your trajectory. Um, you've always had a natural, I feel like you've always had a pretty natural feel for the water and uh, a natural ability to race well and just go for it. Just, just lay it on the line. Um, so would you, would you, but you weren't, you weren't like big, 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 super big, super muscular guy. I mean, but yeah. to go that fast, you know, you were grabbing good water and spinning your arms pretty good. I remember my age group coach telling me this. <clears throat> and now, you know, I'm uh, I'm a lot older and grown up and I'm, I'm, I'm 46 now. And I, you know, as I look back over my life and think about certain seasons and certain things about myself, I know one thing about myself that is unique to me is I, I, I really pay attention to a lot of details. I'm a very detail oriented person. So it's helped me with my adult life with the things I do now. But when I was back then, I didn't know why I did the things I did, but it makes sense now. Uh, and when my coach, he came back from some sort of coaches conference or coaches event that he went to back then in the mid eighties. Uh, and he came and he said that it was important for your hand in freestyle to make an S when it moved through the water. That's what he said. And so, and, and I'll always remember this. And I, and I, I took this into my, I've done some coaching here and there uh, in the early, in uh, 2000 to 2006, I did some club coaching here in Half Moon Bay. Uh, and I teach these things to the kids. And this is all from when I was in club from the ages of, from the like club team, which was just 10 years old 
till 13. And then I moved at 13 and a half or so, I moved to the senior group. Uh, and he taught me how to move your hand in an S. And then the three most important drills of freestyle, which I'm sure you do as well. Catch up, leg touch, and fingertip drag. Okay. And so what was the second one? Catch up drill, leg, leg touch drill, and fingertip drag. What's, so leg, just, what's leg touch drill? Well, the whole... This is how I've always thought of freestyle when I swim. It's just in my, oh, and another thing, my senior coach, Jack Ridley, shout out to love, Jack Ridley. Love Jack, by the way. Yeah. Uh, he taught me to always swim taller than you are. Yeah. And so those drills that I did, which, you know, catch up drill, everybody knows that to reach out in front. Yeah. Leg touch is the opposite end where your thumb is touching low on your upper thigh. So thumb by thigh. Yeah, thumb by thigh, I guess, would be another way to say that. I, I've heard you say that before. Yeah. So I always thought of those things. Get straight out in front of the shoulder and reach right out so as far as you can. And then leg touch. So just the length. I always thought about length when I was swimming. And then the fingertip drag was to, you know, get you to roll your hips and get on your side and have good rotation with your body. Yeah. So it's those three drills. And then, like I said, my coach taught me about the, moving in an S. And I always thought about those things. I also thought a lot about getting to deep water. But that was later on in my, as I got to college. I didn't think about that till then. But as a youngster, that's, those are the things I thought about. Yeah. I remember studying the S pattern too. My coach telling me about that. And now the top Olympians don't do that anymore. It's just straight I know. through. And then we used to watch, you know, Matt Biondi and Tom Jager, and they would hydroplane, you know, with their head kind of high and looking yes. up. And so we were like, well, I guess we need to swim like Matt and Tom. And we'd kind of have our head kind of up high. You know, now we know yep. you got to have your head kind of down. Yeah. So it's funny how things evolve. But, but hey, we went pretty fast despite all that. Yeah. Uh, and it, But, yeah, you never, you never stop learning. You never stop doing the drills right. And you always listen to your coach, even, even if, you know, we evolve into other things later. You still got to listen to your coach and do your best with what you and, know. And one thing I've learned, and I'm sure you would agree from all of the experience that we've had traveling around, seeing international swimmers. Well, like when I went to the Olympics in 1992 and you get to see all these swimmers from around the world that you've only read about in Swimming World magazine, you know, the Germans and Swedish swimmers, Swimmer. Australians and Japanese and Russians and like, I mean, some of these guys had terrible strokes. I remember some Swedish guy. I don't I don't remember his name, but just terrible. It's almost like he didn't even kick, but he was going like, I don't know, like 147 in the 200 free. Yeah. Anders Homerts. He, he had the water bug stroke with, yeah. with the two beat kick. Yeah, that guy. And, you know. So one thing I've also learned as I've grown up in swimming is everybody's body type is going to move a certain way. And I don't know, you know, we've got these drills and these fundamentals that we need to stick to. But then there are people that go way outside of those those rules and they break them and they still go super fast. So, you know, yeah. to each his own, I guess. No, the journey of an ultimate swimmer is, you know, becoming one with the water where your body type, you know, you take your body type and you do whatever it can to grab more water, to spin the arms faster, to be, yep. you know, become more streamlined, all those things, you know, and everybody's a little bit different. The journey's a little bit different. So, yep. well, I, I, I just find it fascinating how fast you went at 14. Uh, the rest of high school went pretty well. And then you got recruited to colleges. Tell us. Yep. Tell us about any other epic high school moments and then why you picked Berkeley over the others. I remember the going to the Olympic festival, which they used to have. That was very exciting. Yes. I was, I don't know. I think I was 16 when I went and that was really well, we, fun. We were on that one together too, right? It was in Minnesota. Yeah. 90 <laughs> Minneapolis. The first yep. time the big pool opened yeah. for the festival. Yep. Yeah. Which team, was, do you remember which team you were on? No. Were you the red team, the West team? I was, I feel like I was, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I was on the blue, the South team, the blue team. Yeah, yeah. that was fun. Um, my senior year in high school was, a, was was really kind of a highlight for me as well. I wanted my, my, my state meet, 
my coach Jack and I talked about what you know you can only do two events in high school so we we're like okay what are we going to do this year and we just kind of zeroed in on the 50 free and the 100 fly and I was like oh what if I could be the first high schooler to ever break 20 seconds so like I thought about it night and day I thought about it in practice I thought about it at school and I just like I mentally visualized it and it was like so exciting and we got to the state meet which is always in February for the state of Washington. And we're at that great pool, which was built for the Goodwill Games in, in Federal Way, Washington. So that's where we had our, our state meets. Um, and in the prelims, I went 2002. So it was oh. like, oh my gosh, it was so exciting. It was a national high school record for public schools. And that same year, Joe Hudipole went 2001. That's and right. He was, he got the national record for private schools and we both missed going under 20. So um, I went a little slower the next day finals, but that was still a, an exciting time for me. And, you know, to get a national high school record was really cool. And, uh, and yeah, then that was it went off to Berkeley. Um, my, my recruiting trips were, they all got more enjoyable. I don't know. Maybe this is, I think the order of recruiting trips has a lot to do with it. It should be very strategic because I always ended up liking the next one more than the previous one. Yeah. So if they had been reversed or in a different order, who knows? I could have been a Longhorn or a, or Wolverine. I don't know. But yeah. uh, Cal was my last one. And I, you know, was impressed with, with Matt Biondi at the time and the program that they had at Cal and, it was also out of all the schools, the closest one to my home in Seattle. Yeah. So I went to Cal. I know I was a little bummed because I, I hosted you on your trip to Texas. Yes. And I was hopeful, but yeah, it all worked. It all worked out in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So. We had some uh, late night wake ups at, at <laughs> on some of my <laughs> recruiting trips, uh, but uh, my my host was Jeremy uh, Simonowski. When I yeah, was there, great guy. Yeah, that was fun. He and I were great friends too. We met at Far Westerns uh, in age group swimming, which is a big meet here in California. Yep. Um, da Damon was in your wedding with us. Yep. I got to, Damon I got and to I were your wedding. Damon was in wedding. And Damon, he got me my Invisalign, which I currently don't have in, but here they are. Uh, he <laughs> is a great Dr. orthodontist uh, out in Sacramento. Uh, Simonowski Orthodontics. Check him out. Yeah. A lot of doctors in the Simonowskis. That's good. Um, so Berkeley was great. You won three. You won the two hundred fly three years in a row. Yeah. Is that sophomore, junior, senior year? Yeah. Yep. That's impressive. Do you remember the, the average? What those times were for each of those years? It was around one forty three, right? I don't remember low. the, the hundreds, but I do remember like it, the first. The, my, uh, I think I went one forty five one in my sophomore year and got first. Then junior year, I got, I went 144, five, I think, and got first there. That was in Minnesota again. Sophomore year was in Indy. And then the final year was at UT, 92. Yep. And, or um, I'm sorry, 96. And I got first there and I, I really went well, 143.2. And that was my fastest. So I dropped a good amount of time from the previous year. 143.2. That's a good good time. Yeah. I remember Eddie Eddie Reese, my Texas coach, had me swim it in 1994. And uh, I was not happy about it. And I went like 146.0 and I made semifinal or yeah, I made the consoles. And I was mad because mm. I there was <laughs> there was like of the 16 guys, eight of them were foreigners. Oh, the 200 fly that year. And I was just kind of a little bitter. I was like, oh, yeah. Man. All these foreigner guys are good 200 flyers. And I didn't, I didn't make the and final. You switch, did you switch over to the 200 back after that? No, no. That was my senior year. I just, I would normally do the 100 free. Uh, actually, my junior year, 93, I think it was. Yeah. Junior year, 93 was 200 fly that year. Okay. So, but anyway, so I think that was the year you won though. Was, was that your sophomore year? Or would that have been yeah, your ninety four? Let me think. Actually, no, 90, 93, You weren't there yet. Or was your freshman year? No, I was. I was a freshman there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So, so you made the final. I made the console. So. Yep. Um. So kind of cool. 
Well, any, any other highlights or epic moments or cool things you learned at Berkeley or training with North Thornton? God bless him. Yeah. Rest in peace. Great yeah. coach. Great, uh, great, great guy. What else, what else about Berkeley do you remember? Well, Nort, who, who recently passed away, and um, he was uh, a very uh, revolutionary coach. He brought in all kinds of thought. Um, we spent a lot of time on technique. Uh, he had a, a, a room that they had built with some engineer at Cal, and it was called the Speed Circuit. And uh, it was these machines that they just made in like some warehouse somewhere, handmade, and they're like pulley systems where you've got this steel cable tied around a, a pulley system and it's controlled with, you know, you could use these knobs and, and it can control how much resistance there is. And so we would do, I think there were about 18 different stations and all of them were, you know, it's like weightlifting machines, but they're resistance and you do it with, um, it's to, to do it with speed. Yeah. And then the, they were all tied to this computer and uh, it would generate like this final number, which represented the amount of power you uh, generated while doing this movement for 30 seconds. And then you would stop. We take a break and go to the next machine. Uh, and it was called the speed circuit. It was it was yeah. fun. And we all had fun in there, at, at, you know, making jokes with each other and looking at the scores at the end of all the power we made. Um, so that was fun. He also had. I don't know. Again, I think he was always trying to be ahead of his time. Uh, he, he had three motorized, and that was three, not three. <laughs> he had three motorized pulley machines that would pull us in the water, like across 50 meters. Yeah. Uh, so we'd put on these belts, and we'd go to the other end of the 50-meter course, and he could program in how fast it was going to pull us. So let's say, you know, long course, we're going to go a 26 or a 27 flat or whatever. Okay. So then he programs it in and the machine pulls you at that speed and you swim at it and you feel, and you can, and, and it's pulled. Sometimes it would pull you faster than what you can really go. And you could really feel the resistance on your body. So he was always thinking of just technology and incorporating science and technology into, into training. So uh, that was fun. We had fun with it. Yeah. I love that. Well, I had a great time on my my recruiting trip there. Uh, you know, two years before you got there, I took my recruiting trip in '89, yeah. and uh, I just I just loved it. And uh, but ultimately, Texas is where I went. But yeah, I uh, I always appreciate Nort, and of course, you know, Matt Biondi's legacy. And then I was so proud of your legacy. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare and take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. You went to the... 92 Olympics for Turkey. You had dual citizenship yeah. with Turkey, thanks to your parents. So you, you, uh, the Turkish uh, committee says, "Hey, you're fast enough. Why don't you swim for us?" And here's a red suit. And then that's then that's it, right? Yeah, that was it. I went and had lunch in the cafeteria, sitting next to the German tennis player. Now I forgot his name. All of a sudden, Boris. You, Boris. Boris Becker. Yeah, Boris Becker. Yeah, he was big he's, time in '92. Oh yeah, he was giant. But yeah, I went, uh, I was 18. I just graduated high school. And uh, since I was born in Turkey and moved to U.S. when I was six, six seven months old, I, uh, I was a citizen. So I was able to represent Turkey in the 92 games. And that was just, it was really fun. More than the times. I mean, I didn't go any best times. I, I pretty much equaled my best times, but just the experience of being there, uh, seeing it all and, and, uh, being part of it, walking around in the village was really, really, really fun. Yeah. A lot of people I talked to back in the day said Barcelona was a great, great city for the Olympics. So just mm -hmm. a lot of fun, a lot of good scenery, a lot of nice venues. The pool, the pool venue in particular had great seating and great scenery. So, yeah, that was a, it was, well, you know, I went to just one, but it was, it was definitely a highlight. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then in 93, um, did we did we make um, pan packs together that year, Japan? Yeah, we went to Kobe. Kobe. Yes. And we uh, we went to Japan, I think, oh, three times in the next six years together. Um, or twice, at least twice. Yep. So I went to the World University Games in the middle of that in 95. And that was in Japan too? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I was 93, 95, 97 for my Japan stuff. You were 93 okay. and 97. Yes. So 93, we're on the team together for the first time, and we start bonding yep. and hanging out and laughing at each other's jokes. And yep. uh, and we're in the same group. We're 200 free. We're usually 200 yep. free group, the 200 group together. And um, I don't remember how we did the 800 free relay, I think. I think we did good. I think we won the gold in the Probably 93 yeah. Pan Packs 800 free relay. Because that I was pre- Michael Klim and Ian Thorpe, so we and Grant Hackett, so we were, we were able to beat the Aussies then. Yeah, Aussies weren't a factor back then, and because um, they just had Kieran Perkins, and he wasn't at that meet. So, so yeah, we had a great time. Yeah. Um, and then '94 it gets even better. We go to Rome, Italy, which is oh, one of my favorites. Awesome. World champs in Rome. You and I are roommates on that one. Yep. And. Uh, we had this incredible room at this beautiful hotel that basically had a view of Rome and a view of the Vatican. And, you know, every day for our nap, they had these awesome shades that would make the room completely dark. Yeah. It's like a Italy thing or it European mechanical. thing. You just push a button in, and these things yeah. come down. And we get totally dark. We have, we have these best naps and um, man, we had, we had a great time and, we just always had great conversations. We were just laughing like crazy. And um, and then our, our 400 free relay together, we did really well. Yeah, that was a, I, that's a definitely a highlight of my swimming career. I was before. second. You were third. We both yep. had great – we both had lifetime best splits yep. of 49 low. And we won. Gary Hall anchored us. Yep, we Gary beat, Hall, Gary we Hall beat Jr. Alex Bob, Bob and the Russians. Yep, and we won the gold. It was really a special moment because I was having a pretty bad meet otherwise at Rome. So that relay with you was really a highlight. Yeah, we got pumped up for that. The relays yeah. will do that to you every time, no matter what's going on. You just get up, you get you 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 know you get excited. You got your teammates, and you just rise up to the occasion. Yeah, yeah, we both dropped like half a second off our over half a second off our best time on that relay. Yeah, so I think we were both forty nine three something like that. But um, so 95, where, did you go anywhere in 95? Because I made the World University Games. That one I decided to pass on. I, I just took the, took the season off after that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't make the, the A team. And so yeah, they, I decided yeah. I'll just take some time off before we head back to, you know, right. back to training again. Yeah. So I didn't make the A team either. And, um, so I thought, well, I'll just go to the World University Games. And you had a breakout. You had a lifetime best. I did a lifetime best time. I had a big breakthrough in my 200 free. We got to win the 400 free relay, the 800 free relay. Um, got to carry the flag for the whole delegation, like all the sports. Wow. The other captains of the other sports elected me to carry the flag. It was crazy. And we had a great time in Japan. I, I just always raced well in Japan. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> So then this is where your story gets kind of interesting. In 96, you're all in for America to represent USA, and you're racing tuner fly and tuner free. And a big – the first big valley, you, you yeah. just missed the team. Yeah, yeah, the 200 free. I, I got seventh and missed it by about two-tenths of a second or so. But, yeah, you know what happens. It happens, you know, you just, uh, you try, your, you do what you can and you show up that day and you swim and can't control the other lanes. And yeah, that's just what, that's what, it, that's what it was in what God had for me that day. Well, you get right back in the saddle, by the way, I just want to, well, we can talk about it more later that, Everybody deals with disappointment. Everybody deals with the valleys. Everybody deals with with uh, 
the death of a dream. And the death of a dream is much like the death of a loved one. There's, there's the grieving process, you know, you're, you're sad, you're angry, you're, you know, and then you kind of work full circle and you realize, okay, this is, what can I learn from this? How can I, how can this make me stronger? How can I comfort someone else? And you kind of come out the other side better for it. But in the, in the midst of it, it's very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult to see the big picture and what, what this is all for. And so, but you get back in the saddle in 97, we go back to Japan yeah, that was a great time as well. And um, we get we get back on the horse and get training again. And um, I, I had at that time I finished my eligibility at Cal and was kind of feeling ready for a change of scenery. And that's when I moved out to Tucson, Arizona, to train at the University of Arizona uh, with the Wildcats there with Coach Frank Bush and. Chad Carvin was there, another great American swimmer, yeah. and I uh, just thought, hey, I want to train with another great American swimmer and uh, really be focused on racing and workout. And so I called up Frank and said, hey, it's Ur, and here's my situation. What do you think? Can I come out there? And he said, I, I'd be honored to have you out there. So I packed my bags and moved to Tucson in... 19 in around may of 1997 that's right i remember that I remember yeah that. and so things are looking good we we uh go to japan that summer and then january of 98 we go to perth for the the yep. second world champs together yeah so this is now four years five years later we're still on yep. the team together and we yep. go to world champs in perth which is a great city too yeah that was a great trip and we were roommates there as well, and uh, we had a good time. I didn't swim. I didn't swim very well at that meet, but um, but we had a great time. We did. I just remember those crocodiles at the crocodile farm next to the hotel. They were like dinosaurs. I they don't remember huge. those guys. Yeah, one. I don't know. One day we went to a crocodile farm, and they were just huge. They were like as no, big as a car. Just, as I was listening to you when you went to the world university games and just something to, you know, note and comment on, you never know when you're going to swim your best. Like some of the best times I've ever had in my, as results, you know, best times for my swim times have come at sometimes unexpected times. Sometimes you plan for it and you're ready and you're like, everything comes together and, and you go your best time just as you, as you plan. Other times it doesn't like your, your time when you went to the world university games, you know, and mm -hmm. I decided to pass on that trip. You went and whatever the reason, the training and the, the, your body and everything, just the timing was right. And you went an amazing time. I think you were like sixth in the world or something. Yeah. Um, I, I got to, my time went catapult me to first in the world that year. Oh gosh. In yeah. 95. It was, I was first in the world before 96. So it was like a big, a big deal. Yeah, so you know that, and when you mentioned the '98 Worlds, I went my best time in the 200 free, leading off the 800 free relay in prelims. You know, and you just you just never know when. So, it just want to encourage people take your opportunities. You know, like maybe one of the regrets I can think back on is maybe it probably would have been a good idea to go on that University Games trip. You never know. You just take your opportunities. And if you end up not doing well, you know, you still have something to learn. And it's a great experience anyways. But you never know when those, when it's all going to just happen. Take every chance you got. Yeah. If you get, if you get a chance to make a USA team and get free food and free massages and go race, you should. That's, yes. That's the moral of the story. And back then, <laughs> you couldn't get a swim cap with your name on it unless you made the USA team. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a big deal. You can yeah. now. It's just like you know, anyone has them. Age yeah. group swimmers have them. That's no right. Fans. But back when we were swimming, you had to, you know, you had to get on the national team to get those caps. So it was yeah. a big deal. That's right. And we laughed so hard on that World University Games trip in '95. I almost peed in my pants. We were laughing so hard at different intervals and skit night and in the dorms at night. They had bunk rooms. They had. They had. 12 of us in a room 
Oh my! It was, it was a weird dorm setup where there was twelve of us to a room, and it was it was a hoot. We were we were laughing pretty hard. So if you were if you were there, I would have really peed my pants every day. But well, I did that actually in uh, in ninety seven after a drug test. the The bus ride was like an hour long. We're going straight through the cities of Japan. You know, it's not like you jump on a freeway and you're busting over to the hotel in 10, 15 minutes. And so the drug testers like, you're going to get drug tested. So I always had a system. And so everybody take note. You got to have your You don't want to be there for hours after your race. Everybody's gone home and you're trying to, you know, give your sample for your drug test. And then you, you gotta, can finally go home. Got to be hydrated. I always drank after my race. I drank a multivitamin, so it would never be diluted. Right. Anyways, so I did that, and yeah, I drink a lot of water too. And then we get on this bus, you know, do my drug test, get on the bus right on time, don't miss a beat, and uh, you know, there's traffic, people running all over the place, and little carts, and jamming up the traffic, and. There's no where to go, so I had to resort to other methods, which I'll keep <laughs> keep private. But it did involve a Gatorade bottle. But uh, <laughs> but you know those bus rides are are terrible when you're uh, after a I drug do, test. I do remember that trip. It was Fukuoka, Japan, and it yes. was about a 45 minute bus ride with traffic. It was over an hour, and. I had my book. I had my favorite book with me. So I was so happy because I was reading. I was so into my book that the bus ride went by quick. But yeah, when you got to go to the bathroom, it's not not fun. If so then a chance to make a team to either go to Italy or Japan, go to those no matter what. <laughs> that's, that's the moral of the story. Japan had amazing food. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we great food in Japan. Great, yeah. great crowd, great electronics, <laughs> great food. So we always had a good time there. So then 99, we go after World Champs 98 in Perth, Australia, 99, we try out the new Sydney pool to That's kind right. of dress rehearsal for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. And so 99 pan packs in Sydney was wonderful. Great time to get racing, lots of different races. And it's not as, you know, it's low pressure. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really pan packs is really really fun um i wasn't very good there either but um but it was a good time how did you how did you do at that sydney one at sydney 99 i was right on my best i didn't go a best time but i got i got <clears throat> got a bronze in the 200 fly if i remember correctly or a silver i don't remember and then our relay also 800 free relay got a silver yeah um uh, I don't remember I, if I did the 200 free or not. I don't think I, think, I did. I think it was one of those. It was, it was the 400 free relay or the 800 free relay. My relay split was 0 0.01 or, or negative oh, 0 your, 0.01. Your exchange? Yeah, the exchange was negative 0 0.01, like, which is like you don't want that. Like it's too, yes. too perfect. And I remember the coaches were getting on me. Yes. But I was like, hey, it was legal. Yep. But so then it's now 2000. Yep. Indianapolis Olympic trials and another crazy Valley moment. Yep. You missed the team for the second time yep. by even a smaller margin. Yeah. Just a hundredth or two. Yep. That was uh, again, the 200 free got seventh and uh, by one, one hundredth and yeah. And, uh, for me, for my story, I mean, that was also a time in my life where I was, I knew I was coming to the end of my swimming because I had been swimming. It was my 17th year of swimming and, <clears throat> you know, feeling kind of the, the fatigue of the sport and the, the demand of it and how, you know, you can't really let off the gas because that's just how the sport is. I, I feel like training is different these days. I wonder if swimmers have better longevity. I mean, 17 years is still pretty long <clears throat> to be doing a competitive sport for swimming. But um, I wonder if, you know, if training, the kind of training that people do now would allow athletes to 
maybe not have a mental burnout. Um, anyways, but for me, that was um, another tough time. Um, and just for myself, I would say, you know, sometimes you don't, my faith was really important at that time because I didn't have another opportunity. I, I was, I was engaged to be married in October of 2000 and, you know, I was ready to be done with swimming just because it was getting to be pretty tiresome for me mentally. Uh, so I ended it up going 149 flat and missed the team. And I, and I didn't walk away from it saying, well, let's, you know, we'll get back to it again. There's, you know, there's always a next season. So there wasn't a next season. So I kind of ended my, my career on a disappointing uh, note, you could say. And, uh, but it, it was a chance for me to trust that God had a plan for my life that was different. And, you know, sometimes we're not going to know the answers to these questions until, until we get to heaven. But it's just, uh, that's what it was. It just was what it was. You know, people get seventh, people miss the team, people get third. Uh, people like, I think his name was Steve Crocker, always getting third to Tom Jager and Matt Biondi. I mean, yeah. that's just what was, uh, that's how my sport or my, my experience was defined by that. And uh, it's okay. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say how proud I am of you because it's a very difficult um, interlude in your, in your journey that those two moments, missing the, missing the team in 96, missing the team in 2000, um, you know, it's just, it's just heartbreaking, but you always, you know, fought for a, a good perspective and a good attitude. And, and your faith was a huge part of that because you knew God had your best interests in, at heart. God, God loved you no matter what. And that yep. he was going to make something beautiful out of this whole journey. He wasn't going to waste anything. And, you know, be, because of your, your maturity and your character and your faith, you, you had this wonderful woman, Liesl, ready to get married to a few months later in October yep. of 2000. You know, one of my highlights was getting to be in your wedding as, as one of the groomsmen and yeah. to, to watch you guys start your life together. And now to see your seven beautiful children and running your swim school in, in the Bay Area and specifically in Half Moon Bay and how you guys live your life and how you're so encouraging uh, to so such an encouraging light to so many and to me and, and my family. I mean, it's just awesome. So I, I, I guess I say all that to, to encourage you and encourage anybody listening that these valleys don't really define us. They refine us. But um, there's so much more left in life to do. So many more wonderful things. And, you know, I, 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 it's fun to reminisce on these little swimming memories together. But the memories you and I cherish are just us laughing in your living room, walks yeah. on the beach, you know, with our families, you know, go and grab some, some food or ice cream together, you know, just in doing life together. Yeah. And so it is a process. It's the process. It's not. Like you said, Josh, we can't be defined by the single moment, you know, the the one minute or the two minute swim or whatever it is, because, you know, we're training for a whole year. There's or even if you're thinking of like Olympics, you're training for four years for one minute of performance or two minutes of performance. It's just and if if, if that's what everything is hinging on, that's a lot that's a heavy cost to pay a heavy price to pay for if your payoff is just that, you know, that one thing or else. Yeah. So people who may not get their goal or their dream, you know, just know that that that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it's good to get your dream. It's good to work for your dream, but it doesn't define you. Like you said, it, the process is much richer than just, you know, I'm not trying to be pessimistic or just say like, oh, it doesn't matter if you get it or not. I'm not saying that. It, no. But the process it matters. The process matters. Matt Biondi said that at, at the 96 Olympic trials, he, was, he came one night and gave a speech and he said, 
it's all about the process of self-improvement. I remember yes. his speech and uh, self-improvement involves failure too, or not getting something you wanted. So mm -hmm. your sport is one part of your life, but you know, there are other parts of our life that continue on, even if one area of our life or one thing that we do stops and ends, there's more, there's more to the story. Yeah. And that's what an ultimate swimmer understands. And they pursue uh, excellence physically in the water. We pursue excellence mentally with our studies and our positive attitude. And we pursue excellence spiritually in being well-rounded, you know, knowing yeah. how to get along with others, get along with God. So I think that's uh, what you've done very, very well is not only you know, pursue excellence and give your give your whole heart to swimming, but you've also, you know, given yourself in your develop your relationships and develop your relationship with God. And it's just it's just a beautiful thing and and really a great example for me and many others. And so I <laughs> when I thought of you or your life and my life, you know, watching you, you have this natural feel for the water. You're naturally very funny and and lots of full of humor and and just easygoing and and but you also have you know, now you're, you're a man of faith. So it's the three F's, feel, funny, faith. You got a good feel oh, in the yeah. water, a natural, funny, and uh, you're a man of faith. And so maybe maybe you could just talk about, you know, what you do to develop yourself spiritually, you know, that, that works for you guys practically. Because it's crazy. You're running a swim school. You've got your, your four swim schools that you and your family help run. Is the most successful swim schools in the world. And it's just it's just a lot of stuff going on. You got the seven kids. You still take care of yourself physically, getting a little swim now and again, and time with your wife, Liesl. You know, give us some tips of what works for you to to stay to stay sharp. Well, like when we were swimmers, our, our swimming was our focus, and so that became our lifestyle of what we did in order to always promote and support that focus. And one of the things I always I thought about in the final year of my swimming career when I was 25, just thinking about like my life beyond swimming, like, what am I going to do? Like I've been doing this for 17 years, focusing on, you know, this and these goals. And I thought of myself as being really like important, like doing important things. Like this is a big deal. I'm trying to make the Olympics, you know? So, and when you're doing that, your, your lifestyle is, designed to kind of support that so the same thing now with 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 my faith i it has to be a lifestyle lifestyle it's not just something on a particular day it's not a sunday you don't just feed yourself spiritually uh on a sunday you you, you gotta eat multiple meals throughout the week uh so feeding daily and often on uh i i try to I read, I read my Bible. Uh, I listen to things on my phone when I'm driving, uh, like the daily audio Bible. Uh, I listen to music uh, that kind of encourages me. And, but, it, but all of these things that I'm doing are focused on this goal now, which is to develop my, my heart and my faith, because out of that, everything else is, is flowing from there. So I, I know that I'm not going to have the right attitude or the right, perspective on taking care of my kids or being friendly to my wife when I'm tired if I'm not doing these other things. So I purposely surround myself with, with some of these things and kind of have these disciplines to, uh, to help me do those better. Yeah. I love uh, going down to your basement where you've got your guitars yeah. and your music time and yeah. some worship time and just doodle time and you're really good at the guitar. You're really good at music. And you've been able to actually be and help out with some church bands. Yeah. Yep. Playing the guitar and helping do sound and audio for, for churches. And you've really utilized, you know, those gifts in, in a cool way. And so that's one of my favorite things to do with you when I visit you at Half Moon Bay is yeah. to go down the basement and watch you play some whatever it is, even if it's worship songs or Christian songs or U2. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. <laughs> music is, 
Definitely. I've, I've loved music ever since I was little. I remember listening to the first music I ever remember listening to was John Denver when I was four years old. And I was just mesmerized by this music. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do enjoy playing the guitar and other things as well. But um, yeah, no. anything I can and I do to just try to keep feeding myself the right things. Yeah. Well, I just want to give a quick shout out to Liesl Kolbeson, your wife, Liesl Kolbeson Tanner. And she was a great swimmer in her own right, national champion, uh, multi-time All-American at, at Arizona, a couple times on the USA team, just yep. incredible swimmer. And um, we just we just love her. So just yeah. want to make sure, you know, we recognize behind every great man is an even better woman. So, That's right. That's right. Yeah, she was a great swimmer. And we met in Tucson. And uh, she was on a few national teams as well. And uh, yeah, she was not one of the taller ladies, but she had some fire in her belly and she would race. She raced really well. And she used that swimmer toughness to uh, help produce seven beautiful children. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a gift. That's uh, the toughness coming out to be able to do that. That's and right. Take care of all of that's that. That's right. So, well, tell us real quick, shout out about your uh, uh, La Petite Berlin. There's four sites in the Bay Area. The original yeah, one, we have, Half Moon we Bay, have four, right we here, have, you guys. Yep, Half Moon Bay is, was the first one that opened up. My, my Liesl's family started it in 1979. And it's been, so we're on their 42nd year. And uh, we've got one in Redwood City. We've got one in San Francisco, and we have one in San Bruno as well. That's amazing. Sorry, my daughter just came in real quick for a second. No problem. <laughs> well, you do a great job helping manage the swim schools, and uh, what, a, what a tremendous opportunity y'all have to – how many kids a week do y'all help kids fall in love with the water and be water safe on average? Well, before, before the pandemic, is. um a little over 10,000 a week. So out of those four sites, we got 10,000 plus kids coming in a week. Um, my in-laws were very revolutionary when they came up with their curriculum for La Petite Beline and their model, their business model, but also their teaching model. Um, the teaching model and the curriculum really promotes and it's, it's, uh, synchronize as well with the business model. Like they support each other well. It's a good business model and it's a good curriculum. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's done well. And uh, we're, and, we're just doing our thing here. Yeah. And so all your kids have the benefit of playing in the, the La Petite Berlin swim school pool. That's and right. Your son Brooks learned to swim there. Now Brooks just finished his freshman year at University of Arizona. In his freshman year. Freshman year, he he went. What was the time in the Turner Fly? Your son Brooks. Uh, this was his sophomore year. Oh, sophomore this, year, right, right. This right. year, he beat my best time ever yards. He went one forty three oh oh nine or something. So oh he, he beat his dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, that's amazing, and it's so cool because your son Brooks and my son Luke are the same age and swim the same events. Yeah. So Luke went to Missouri. Brooks went to Arizona, and. Uh, so Luke sometimes gets Brooks long course and Brooks usually gets Luke short course. And, but it's fun to see him go back and forth and you and yeah. I are in the stands cheering him. And yeah. uh, it's just, it's just a beautiful thing to share yeah, that with fun. our sons. It is. So yeah. what, uh, any last little parenting advice you'd want to throw out there for swim parents? Hmm. There's a lot of advice. I don't know. Uh, Well, I can just say I'll share something that I've, I'm thinking about right now in my in my life, you know, in my se in the season I'm in now. So we've got Brooks in college. He's in, finishing his seventh year or second year there. One of my my other oldest daughter, Channing, she's going to go to SMU next year. So we're going to be down to five kids at home. But one thing that I've God's been teaching me is to appreciate the difference in each child. Uh, they're all so unbelievably different from each other, even though they're all so similar. 
but they are all very different and they're individuals. And so that's also hard, you know, because sometimes the way you parent the first or the second child is not going to be the way you parent the third or the fourth child and um, the way you discipline them or the things that you might say to encourage them. One thing that encourages Brooks is not going to encourage my other kids. Mm -hmm. And so that whole trying to find their love language, their communication styles, they're all so different. And instead of trying to get frustrated about it, there's a way to flip that and see the the good in it, the positive, and to, to find out well, what will motivate this person. It might not be what I've been doing with my other kids. So that just means we have to find something else. So that's something I've learned just in the last six months with what with some of my kids that, you know, you kind of keep banging your head against the wall like, well, I did this with all these other kids and it's not working with this one. So why is it not? So... You just mm-hmm. got to learn a new a new method because yeah. the child they're going to respond to be motivated by something different. So that's yeah. my advice. Just, just keep praying and loving and researching. Figure out what works for each kid because it's each kid's different. Each season's different. Yeah. So that's good. I want to close with a little lightning round of your favorite things. Oh so, man. Um, favorite swim race in your life? Can you remember? Do you have a Do you have a favorite? Oh, I don't know. There's that foreign free relay in Rome, mm-hmm. 200 fly in Clovis, 98 nationals, prelims. Yep. There's there's too many to count. Did you have a favorite pool you ever raced in? <sighs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so underwhelming. <laughs> No, I don't. Uh, there are lots of great pools. Uh, you like Seattle. You like Austin. Rome was great. Yeah, lots of pools. Sydney was great. There's lots of good pools. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? Math. What was your major in college? I forgot to ask you. I did. Ec- I studied economics. Didn't quite make it to it uh, in Berkeley because it's very competitive. So I transitioned to something a little bit simpler, social welfare. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your favorite drills for free. Do you have a favorite drill for fly? Uh, yeah, I kind of made up my own. I don't I don't think this is there is even one, but I there's no name for this. I just did it because I liked it. So it was a combination of doing like one arm fly. So three right, three left. I would do that a lot for warm up, do three right, three left, and then three both. But yeah. then I also threw in Another thing that I started doing where I do three right arm and after the third one, I'd kind of dive down a little lower and just do some underwater dolphins and then three left arm and dive down and do some underwater dolphins. And then when I was going into the two, both arms, that's when I would really come up from those underwaters and really do some three fast ones, yeah. uh, three fast, both arm swims. So Sorry. kind of, a combination of one arm and diving down and doing some underwaters, kind of mixing that up. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And um, which is, which of your seven is your favorite kid? <laughs> it's a, I the know, that, I know speak, the family joke. So that's why. The one who speaks English. <laughs> it's but, uh, Se- Sevlin, right? She's your favorite. Well, She's the youngest right now, so she's kind of like the little jewel of our hearts. Uh, so. that, that was the joke when I was there last year. Is like that was a running joke. Yeah, everybody knows she's your favorite. Oh but. well, I didn't say that, but <laughs> I would. I'm not going to argue right now. They're, they're they're all our favorites. Yeah. And uh, new favorite TV show. We were just talking about it before we went on. Yes, The Chosen. It's uh really well done, and it just brings the the life of Christ to life in a very creative way, an intimate way, a very real way. But also, you know, what I really love about it is the way that the other characters are developed. Mm-hmm. The disciples, the Romans, uh, you know, just the the people are developed and you you just I mean the gospels are written to, you know, what's written, we can read and 
and, and understand. But this show kind of, you know, the, the Gospels aren't talking about like what they ate for breakfast every day or when they walked. You know, there's so much common stuff and common life that isn't included in these important details of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. But obviously they were people and they were living and they had jobs and homes and worries and cares and concerns and and ev of everyday life. So it, it just, you know, brings it to life. And you, you see that the gospel stories kind of woven into real life. You know, sometimes if you just kind of read the Bible and you're, you know, it can kind of feel like as if those people are different or they were special and they did have a special calling on their lives, but at the same time, they were ordinary people. Yeah, they're still normal humans. So doing ordinary things, telling jokes, laughing, being worried, uh, whatever, you know, just like us. So it, it comes to life. And and then the interaction that they have with Jesus is, and those conversations that they have. And they did a great job of, of presenting that. So I yeah. like it a lot. I do too. It uh, it really moved me. It's one of the best Jesus and best portrayals and best bring to life the New Testament that I've ever seen, and um, you know it, it really moved me because you know, like like you, um, we 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 love Jesus and we love His life and we want to be like Him. We want to love people like Him and we yeah. want to make the world a better place like Him. And so to see this actor do such a cool job of it, it really is. It really moves you. It's like yeah, yeah it that's 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 what we need to be like and uh, what Jesus was like. It's really, really wonderful. Well, I, uh, I appreciate you being an encouragement in my life. And uh, I'm grateful that we've gotten to do so much life together in the pool and out of the pool. And I, I wish everybody could just go in your living room and watch you sing songs with your kids. And, you know, it's crazy. It's not like, you know, you're, you're, none of our lives are perfect. You know, you got seven kids and it's crazy and it's sometimes hard, but it's beautiful because, you, you strive for the humor, you strive to keep it fun, you strive to keep people around you close and healthy, and it's just yeah. beautiful to watch you guys do life. And so I'm, I'm thankful the listeners get a little glimpse of what it's like in the, in the, in the Ur Tanner home in Half Moon Bay, California. Yeah. And um, so hopefully um, this has been an encouragement to, to them like, like you have to me. So any, any final thoughts? No, I just uh, appreciate you, Josh. Thank you for having me on and you do a great job of promoting swimming and promoting good values for the swimming community in the world. So uh, keep it up. Keep up the good work. Yes. And then hopefully we'll have some nutty bars and some guitar sessions soon. Yes. In Half Moon Bay. Our favorite dessert. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Love you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the Hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one of a kind patented honeycomb shock absorbing technology will prevent concussions. And the hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off and it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your ultimate swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal, to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.